I'm not going to dwell on this. This is the uh, this presentation is on behind the scenes at Twin City Lines, and I just put this org chart up to show you what a complex operation Twin City Lines was. And I'm going to put up the PowerPoint now, and uh, we'll kind of we'll kind of walk through a number of these functions, although although not exhaustively because that would just bore everybody. Let's see here. This will take just a moment to come up. Okay, we're going to cover behind the scenes operation at Twin City Lines. And we'll start just by showing a couple of pictures about uh, how the uniforms of the streetcar operators evolved. Uh, this is 1892 at Bloomington Station, which was a, a small streetcar barn at 37th, uh, 32nd in Bloomington. And uh, you have to remember, Twin City Lines was sort of getting on their feet and discovering how to really run a streetcar system. And so when they hired people initially, it's like, well, go out and get yourself a railroad conductor hat and, uh, you know, you can kind of wear almost whatever you want. You should have a watch. And so you can see this is kind of a motley looking uh, crew. Well, contrast that to it's 19, about 1910. Actually, no, this would be about 1912 or 13. And this is outside of Nicollet Station. And here you can see uh, they are much more uniformly dressed. Uh, they've got the big hat badges that had the numbers on. These hat badges were used from about 1905 to uh, 1917. As a matter of fact, they have been very helpful in doing genealogical research because we can see the badge and uh, we can look at the employee appointment cards and, and frequently we can find out who this actually was, which helps with genealogy. Um, after 1917, they went to the small motorman badge with the circular number pin on the side of the hat identifying what their number was. The number was a big deal, by the way. Uh, even today at Metro Transit, uh, you're as if you're a driver, you're as likely to be known by your number as you are by your name. Uh, in the background here, by the way, that's the uh, entrance to Nicollet Ballpark. So, in 1939-38, thereabouts, um, they did away with the traditional pillbox conductor type hat and they adopted the bus driver f type of flat hat that had been used for a number of years in their bus subsidiary, Twin City Motor Bus. Uh, Gene Corby took this picture in 1945. It's one of a whole series of pictures he took of his co-workers. But this kind of shows how they were dressed. You still had to wear a tie. It could be a regular tie or it could be a bow tie. They didn't care. Long sleeve shirts. Um, you had a uniform jacket that you could wear. Uh, this is uh, one of the motorettes. The motorettes had a, um, a jacket that was tailored for, uh, for a woman's body. And they had a smaller, somewhat softer hat and a different, um, a different hat badge. This is uh, an arched badge. It had Twin City Lines logo on it and it said operator. It didn't say motorette, but it was the only one around that actually said operator. Uh, this is uh, one of a number of these collages where they went and they, sent, they had a professional photographer come around and photograph all their employees and they, they put these collages out for a particular year at a particular station. And this shows it in the 1920s after they went to the simple motorman badge on the hat. So, if you were a trainman, meaning a motorman or a conductor, and you reported to work, the first thing you did is you walked up to what they called the cage. You can see why it's called the cage. Um, and inside, this is the uh, station foreman. There was a day foreman and a night foreman. He was responsible for running the place. And this is one of the clerks. There were several clerks. And they were analogous to non-commissioned officers in the military, like a sergeant. They were drawn from the ranks of the trainmen, uh, and their job was to um, their job was to go and dispatch uh, the uh, to assign the trainmen to their runs and to also assign them to their streetcars. And so you had um, somebody called the markup clerk, and this may be the markup clerk. There was a day and a, and a night markup clerk. And their job was to take all the work that there was to do, which was already broken up into runs by the schedule department, and to assign those to the drivers, to not the drivers, to the operators. Um, and uh, what you have to understand is that because there is a big 
a, a, an a.m. peak and a p.m. peak period, and there are twice as many streetcars out as there were in the middle of the day or there were on the weekend, um, you had to go and fit um, these eight-hour assignments for uh, trainmen into this work that didn't necessarily work out to eight-hour pieces. It did for the guys who did the base work, but for those who were running the, uh, the rush hour peaks, they generally had to work split shifts. And um, they might start at uh, five in the morning and work the morning rush hour till say nine o'clock and then come back at three and work till 6 p.m. Um, and that was called the spread from the f first time you uh, went to work to the last time uh, you pulled in. Um, and so there was another clerk whose job it was to go out into the streetcar yard and do what they called the markup, the, uh, the yard markup, where they went and walked up and down all the tracks and recorded where all the streetcars were so then they could be assigned to the motorman and the conductors. And they would say, you know, you have car 1322 on uh, track 23. And this had to be done in such a way that the cars pulled out in order if you had uh, pulled out in time order so that you wouldn't have a crew that came out and found his car blocked by another car ahead of it. Very complex operation. So they would get their assignments and then this is the trainman's room. This was directly outside the cage. Along the wall here you see lockers where, uh, where the trainman could go and put their stuff. And in these cases here were all the work assignments um, all the runs and what each one would show was a time to pull out of the station and then a time for the first terminal and then the time points listed generally vertically uh, for each uh, time point along the trip till you got to the other end of the line and there would be a time for arrival at the end of the line there'd be a little number next to that which indicated how many minutes of layover you had and then the times will go back up as you went back up the line and you go up and down, up and down the lines um, until there was a time to either pull in or be relieved on the line. Uh, often the streetcar stayed on the line all day and uh, two or more crews would crew the streetcar. One crew would get off at the relief point nearest the station and the other crew would get on and then the train one was on his own time to get back to the station. Um, now you notice the uh, build the motorman up here it says uh, notice new time card several times a year the schedules would be changed and all these runs would be changed now because the trainmen would come in and on a recipe card copy down the times for their run and then take it with them so that they knew when there was a new time card a schedule change all these times would change and there was frequently chaos on the first or second day of that because a train one would come in and not copy down, assume that the run stayed the same, because sometimes they did, and go out and, and, and uh, run the wrong trips. So it was a system that was always kind of uh, fraught with difficulty. One thing I should point out here, you see these long benches and all. There were always a fair number of... Uh, of operators of trainmen who were on call and by on call they were there as backup help in the event of unexpected absenteeism or if extra streetcars were needed on the street unexpectedly. Now one of the things that the Amalgamated Transit Union which still represents Metro Transit's bus drivers fought for was to get call time paid. During the the 20s and the Great Depression anyone who showed up on call was unpaid until you actually got an assignment. And uh, eventually the union was able to negotiate the call time was paid. They spent a lot of time at the station and this of course was the era, era of sort of paternalistic management. You know they had a, a streetcar company band and they had streetcar company baseball teams. Well upstairs in each of the stations was what they called the club rooms. And they had reading libraries, um, pool tables, uh, there was uh, always a clubhouse attendant who functioned as a barber, would shine shoes, do all sorts of things like that for tips. These guys spent a lot of time there and so uh, and they hung out. Now one additional thing was 
because you might work a late night run and get in and have just enough time to sleep before you pulled out in the morning, uh, they actually had dormitories upstairs. And uh, you could go and spend the night upstairs in the car house. This is a picture of some guys in the schedule department. The schedule is what really determines what the streetcar company is supposed to do. And there, uh, it, it was a very complex undertaking because the schedule department had to determine how many, how many streetcars and trips were needed so that you didn't have overcrowding, but you also didn't have underutilization of the streetcars. Uh, and then they go, had to go and take all these schedules and break them up into runs, prepare the run guides, um, and the materials that went out to the clerks in the garages to assign the drivers. Uh, there was always a lot of pressure because the cities wanted more service and of course Twin City Lines wanting to make a profit wanted less service um, and more intensive use of the service. And I just threw this one in. This is a Snelling station showing some of the women who are clerical employees. Probably worked in the shop office, probably worked in the employment office. This would be the 1920s, judging from the dress. Now, the trainmen had two sets of bosses. When they were in this station, they reported to the clerks and they reported to the station foreman. And, but once they were out on the street, they reported to the inspectors, uh, who were also called starters. These were the on-street supervisors. And, um, before automobiles, um, they were always stationed permanently at a couple of three locations. This is 5th and Hennepin in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, his office is that little shack. There's a telephone in there. He can call back to headquarters. And what he's doing, he's got his clipboard, and he's checking. Uh, he's always checking the on-time performance of streetcars, especially since it's a snowy day. And then his job was to keep the system on schedule and to uh, try to solve problems as they came up. Uh, you might have a streetcar operator, a, a motorman whose car was defective in some way. He'd check in with the inspector. The inspector would call in, maybe get a replacement streetcar. Um, or if the cars came through late, uh, he might short turn the car. A good example, there was one of these uh, f permanent inspector booths over at 7th and Wabasha in downtown St. Paul. And the Como Harriet and the Interurban cars made a big loop through downtown. Well, if, if they were bunched and coming in late, um, the inspector might have one or two of them uh, short line, make a much smaller loop through downtown, pick up six, seven, eight minutes of, of running time and get back on schedule. Or he might call and say, I need a, I need a couple of extras out here um, to help the line get back on, on, on schedule. Now later on they bought cars for these guys so they could move around, but the, even to the end of streetcar service there were fixed post uh, supervisors. Out on the two long suburban lines, uh, they used telephones to, uh, co uh, to contact uh, the dispatcher. This is North St. Paul at the Henry Street Y. And uh, you'll see the phone booth at the left there. And the operator, before he could proceed the west of the way, rest of the way into the line, because this was the halfway point on the line, he had to go uh, get on the company telephone, call the dispatcher, say, this is car so-and-so, I need permission to go the rest of the way into St. Paul. And that's how they did it. And, of course, these phone booths also helped uh, for if you had a breakdown of some sort. In a previous presentation, I showed you car 1136, which sat outside at Snelling most of the time. And um, its special status was it was the office car for the, for the state fair. And it was equipped with telephones and desks and stuff. And this is inside of it. Uh, and here it's been uh, moved over to the state fair. And these guys are running the state fair operation out of it. This car, this picture is taken on the east end of the Oak Harriet line over uh, at 27th and Yale Southeast, which is in the middle of the Dartmouth interchange of 94, just east of the Mississippi River. But the point of this is to show you this little sign on the dashboard. This is a football special. Um, it's an extra trip that they ran to uh, serve Memorial Stadium, which was just a half a mile behind it over at the University of Minnesota. And so not all the service was scheduled. Um, the most frequent thing was to run an extra. And an extra was simply an extra trip on an established line to handle uh, an extra load. Um, saw one thing, an old newspaper story, where 
uh, in, oh, about 1915 uh, for a gopher game. They ran 70 extra streetcars. They certainly ran a lot of extras for the state fair. Now, the other kind of unscheduled passenger run they would make is charters. And this is where you could go and order up one or more streetcars to, to go anywhere on the streetcar system you wanted. This is right next to the Milwaukee Depot on Fifth Avenue South at Washington. And <clears throat> here you have a whole bunch of kids getting on. And I would wager that these are kids that came off like a summer camp special train on the, uh, from the Milwaukee Road Depot and are now going to go back to their home neighborhood. Um, what's interesting about this is you can imagine it probably took them a little bit of time to board these cars. The cars are parked on the main track of the interurban line. The interurban line was running about every three minutes or so. So I'm guessing that out of the picture to the left are, are several interurban cars that are stacked up behind this thing waiting for the darn charters to get out of the way. Another function the streetcars did is they carried the mail. Starting in the 1890s, uh, they carried mail between downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul, and this is the mailbox. There's actually a metal rack on the back of the box, and um, when it got by the post office in Minneapolis, a postal worker would come out and hang this metal box on. It's got a lock on it, and uh, I believe you could actually go and, and, and there's a slot in the top and you could mail a letter if you wanted, but this, uh, what they did is they ran from post office to post office, um, and they had a whole network of them, uh, and the last uh, inter-post office runs were 1951 going out to Hopkins. Um, that was the very last one. As a matter of fact, this is, um, they took those uh, metal mailboxes off the back of the car by about 1930, but then they, they, they used sack mail. And so this is the Hopkins shuttle car that has come into 44th in France, and the two motormen are transferring the mailbags to the Como Harriet car that will take it downtown, or Oak Harriet car in this case. Um, but this lasted until 1951, and the only reason it went away was that the Hopkins uh, line was, was eliminated. In addition, the post office had a contract with Twin City Lines to um, carry mail carriers. Here we are at the, outside the downtown Minneapolis main post office, and so um, the, the, motor, the conductors would keep track of how many postal workers rode, and then Twin City Lines would send a bill to the post office. Uh, they didn't, these guys didn't actually pay a fare, but this allowed them to be distributed through downtown and other places uh, near their routes where they could go and walk the route. Hose jumpers. If you had a fire and somebody went and laid a hose across the track, presto, um, you no longer can run a streetcar through here because it would go and uh, break the hose and you can't have that. And so to deal with this situation, Twin City Lines had a piece of apparatus that they called a hose jumper. And there's a hole in it, and so they'd put it on top, uh, and the hose would run under, and the streetcar, it's like a little mini bridge going across it. Uh, if, uh, you can't see it in this picture because it's a blow up, but there's actually, uh, off to the left here, there's a Twin City Lines uh, service truck from East Side Station. This is downtown on Hennepin Avenue. And they've just one brought the hose jumper out, and here's the crew and some uh, and a shop man and uh, a couple other people, and they're putting it in place so now they can restore streetcar operation through this fire scene. You had other non-revenue moves on the system. Um, every morning after the rush hour, about 9 o'clock, uh, you had a certain number of streetcars that had to go to Snelling Shops uh, for repairs, or uh, they had to go to one of the other streetcar barns because they had broken down near a streetcar barn that wasn't their own. And so there would be a group of call motormen in, uh, in uh, the trainman's room, and they'd be summoned up to the cage and assigned streetcars to take over to Snelling. In this case, the second streetcar is dead and it's being towed by the first streetcar. It's turning from Como Avenue onto Snelling Avenue on the last lap down to Snelling Shops. And of course they'd call over and the shop would know these cars were coming and they would probably have some cars to go back. So these same motormen then would pick up a streetcar that had been repaired and run it back over to the home station. The uh, Snelling Shops had a building called Central Stores that took in supplies and materials that were used at all the other car houses. And so they had a, uh, this, is, uh, this is the supply car, 
and it was made out of an old streetcar, and you'll notice they cut a door in the middle of it, and it would pull up to the loading dock at the stores department, and they would load in whatever needed to go to the other car houses. And one day a week, uh, this car would go and run one day to Lake Street Station, another day to Nicollet Station, and so on, until it, it had gone to all the stations and transported supplies out and probably brought a certain number of things back. Now, I had mentioned that Snelling Shops was con directly connected to the railroad system. This is, in fact, the store's building, and this is a work motor that has gone out um, to the uh, railroad interchange about a block or two away and retrieved this boxcar and hauled it onto the property where I'm sure there's some materials that need to be offloaded. They'd also bring in coal and other things this way. The inner campus line between the Minneapolis and the St. Paul campus was its own unusual operation. Um, it was owned by the University of Minnesota, and in the midpoint of the line, right over by Highway 280 and Como Avenue, about a block north of that, there, there was a, a, an interchange track that connected this line to the Minnesota Transfer Railway. And Twin City Lines built this little electric locomotive for the U of M, it's painted gold with, uh, I'm sorry, it's painted maroon with gold stripes, maroon and gold. And as needed, it would run down to the interchange and pick up a carload of coal for the power plant over on the St. Paul campus or pick up a boxcar with supplies for the ag campus. So this was the only place where actual freight cars were hauled on the same tracks as the passenger cars. When they needed to uh, salt or sand the tracks in cold weather, uh, this was how they did it. Um, this was one of the, there was a sand car uh, like this that was assigned to each one of the stations. And you can see there were, uh, there were hoppers in here and they could uh, dump it on. They had a sand bin and a salt bin and they used that to help keep the tracks clear. And out at the end of each streetcar line, there were both uh, sand bins and coal bins, coal bins for firing the stove and sand bins for the sanders that were on the streetcar. Now this is where they were. It's a tin box that was under the peanut row seat uh, right behind the motorman. There was one of these boxes on each side and then from here there were pipes uh, that went down and there were actually uh, air operated blowers that would blow the sand down these pipes in front of the wheels so you could get traction in icy conditions. This is the corner of Snelling and University, which was the entrance to Snelling Station Yard. And this guy here and this, uh, is, um, he, he's the switchman, and his job was to go and greet every car that came in and tell it which track to be on. Uh, he could uh, take shelter in this little shed here uh, because uh, you had some streetcars that were bad order. They'd go in the shop tracks. You'd have other streetcars uh, that were sorted in other ways on the tracks. And because there were no electric switches there, his job was to go and line up the switches for them. Uh, they had other employees. I don't happen to have a picture, but uh, they had employees called curve men whose job it was to go out and manually grease the tracks where they curved around and uh, that reduced um, friction, which reduced metal wear on both the rails and the wheels, and also cut down on, on uh, flange squeal, the loud noise uh, if cars went around the curve. Wherever they crossed a railroad grade crossing, um, they had to have a flagman, and this is North St. Paul, where they crossed the Sioux Line. Now, the Sioux Line was there first, so the second railroad to come along, the streetcar, had to go and build and maintain this crossing and had to provide a flagman. Here he is, and you'll notice he's even got a little crossing gate that he will swing out of the way. This, by the way, was often a job that was considered light duty and was given to employees who had been injured on the job or were physically unable to, say, work as a motorman anymore. This was a pretty low-stress job. Uh, here's uh, one of the shop men, and he's cleaning out the flangeways in front of East Side Station. You had to do this in the winter time. If these things filled with ice, the streetcar could actually ride up on the flanges and derail. Now, the Twin City Lines, of course, had lots of track to maintain. <coughs> and it all started over on the east side of the Snelling property where you had uh, the rail pile. Um, 
This is Quaint Crane 74, whose job was just to run back and forth and, and sort rail, lift it on to work cars as needed. Here's a track crew at work on Hennepin Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. Um, and, of course, it was kind of a big job to, uh, to repair track because it was all encased in these granite pavers. So first you had to disassemble the pavers and then you do whatever the track job was. And then you had to put it all back together. Now, if there was a major reconstruction project, in this case, we're up on uh, Penn Avenue at Lowry Avenue in North Minneapolis. And they're building all new track here because the street is being paved. And so to get around that, uh, Twin City Lines has assembled, they had prefabricated uh, track sections and they've uh, created a shoe fly that takes them around, uh, around the construction. A shorter and more common version of this is if they had to close a track for something, there might be like a sewer project or something, they would come out with a crane and they had these prefabricated track switches that they could lay down and then the car would just ramp up onto it at slow speed and down and then you could run wrong way. You could create a switch where you didn't have one before. This by the way is Washington Street Northeast at 18th Avenue Northeast. They needed a lot of gravel for track operations. Um, and so they had three gravel pits. This is the one in South St. Paul off the Concord line, uh, right down in downtown South St. Paul. They had another across from the state fairgrounds on Como Avenue and another up on Johnson Street Northeast uh, at about 16th Street where the Quarry Shopping Center is today. Electricity. This is the load dispatcher and he's inside the main steam station and his job was to go and regulate the flow of electricity, the supply of electricity all over the system to monitor it and do what needed to be done to keep it uh, flowing. <clears throat> the overhead wires were repaired, were built and repaired with these overhead wire cars. This is car 72 which is the St. Paul car and it's on the east end of Snelling Shops at the St. Paul overhead wire office. That's Ward's next to it. But they quickly discovered that if you had a wire car on the tracks, you blocked the streetcars. And so pretty early, they, they started buying overhead wire trucks that could uh, move in, quickly do um, a, a repair, and then get out of the way so the streetcars themselves could run. This is an early one. Here's what they looked like at the end with hydraulic platforms. This is at Emerald and University, the Minneapolis City Limits. See the Minneapolis City Limits sign. And the wire has fallen down, so the truck has come in to repair it. Under their franchises, they were required to sprinkle the dirt streets just with water to keep the dust down. So they had work car uh, 59, which was a tank car. And uh, here it is. This is simply uh, demonstrating how it works. Uh, this is the University Avenue side of Snelling Station. But you can see uh, what they did. And of course, they had to plow the streets they ran on. So this is a plow crew here at Snelling with one of the big plows. And you can see it's got the front plow uh, and the wing plow on it. Uh, the crews came from the ranks of motormen and conductors. Here's the same crew. You had the motorman who also ran the front plow. You had the wingman whose job it was to uh, this, uh, this air lever pushed out the wing plow to the side. Uh, this is the helper. His job was in this case he's pulling the rope to pull the wing plow back in. I guess it, it required manually to pull it in and then uh, he also was responsible for you know salting, sanding, uh, doing whatever they needed to do. Um, it was frequently the case that they'd run down a line and the plows were a little bit wider than the streetcars and you'd have a parked car that, that was just barely in the way and of course they'd go up to the house and try to get person to move it, but if there was no one there to move it, they would actually get on the front and the rear and, and uh, grab a hold of the bumper and push, the, bounce the car up and down, and you could bounce it sideways a few inches and get it out of the way. They would first have to dig it out. If there was a plow windrow on the right side, they'd first have to dig it out. But I saw a newspaper story of this, and they did that something like 70 times, bounced cars out of the way in the course of a, of a shift. So in the, uh, in the shop were shopmen, and their job was to fix whatever needed fixing. This happens to be one, uh, one of those gentlemen mounted on a plow. The previous picture, which was blank, uh, actually was just another picture of a, of a shopman. 
They had service trucks that could go out and do mobile repairs here. This one is set up for pushing a streetcar or pushing a bus. It had tools and everything in the back. They had to clean the streetcars every day. This was actually, um, this is a newspaper photo from the Pioneer Press, and it shows the recently installed, I think it was about 1950, uh, car, automatic car washers. This was a big innovation because before this, um, they washed the exterior of the streetcars by hand. But every night, uh, cleaners would come through and pick up debris and litter in the car, maybe sweep it out. Um, and then once a month, they would do a general cleaning, and that's what you're looking at here, where they'd wipe down all the seats and really clean the car from top to bottom, wash the windows and everything like that. And every five years, the cars would go into the shop and uh, would be lifted up off the trucks, and they would basically they'd fix everything that needed fixing. Here you see uh, wheels being uh, pulled out from under. At Snelling, uh, this is the transfer table where the, uh, that moved the uh, cars uh, between the different buildings. Um, this is one of the uh, shifter cars, and the shifter cars uh, were former cable cars, uh, the last three that had been used on the Selby Hill counterweight. And when the counterweight was replaced by the Selby Tunnel in 1906, they moved these over to Snelling Shops, which opened in 1907. And um, they were designed just to push cars, and in this case trucks, uh, around the, uh, the complex. And they were small enough to fit on the transfer table with, uh, with uh, a streetcar. And some views of the Snelling shops is the last thing we're going to do in this presentation. This is the truck shop. See the overhead cranes. Here's the motor shop. There's an armature down there. They had all these specialized shops. Uh, um, this one right here, uh, I wonder if this is uh, where the foundry was. I kind of think this might have been the foundry. I see a lot of metal parts there. Here's the carpenter shop. Now, when they finished with a car, uh, they would go out and take a test run. This is one of those test runs. You can see it says not in service. There's only a motorman, and I'm guessing this is the shop foreman here. And uh, this is up on the Snelling Avenue line on Pascal Street or up around Midway Parkway. And they, they would run them on the Snelling line because it had less service than the University Avenue line, so they weren't getting in the way of regular service. And this is the last slide. Uh, this just shows one of the buildings that was uh, turned into a lunchroom. Uh, for the shop crew, and of course they all had lunch at the same time. So, that's the end of the story.